credit monitoring workshop. This webinar is being recorded and is scheduled for one hour. My name is Myra Kasuk, and I am the Financial Education Coordinator here at the Los Angeles Police Federal Credit Union. Before we get started, allow me to go over some tips on how to navigate within the GoToWebinar toolbar. I see that we have quite a few people that have already logged on. If you look at the toolbar, you'll see a tab that says Attendees. Underneath that Attendees tab, you should find your name. Underneath your name, there's a small icon that looks like a hand. If you all see that, please click on that hand so that I can make sure that you can all hear me and you also are able to um, see the icon. Okay, I'll wait a little bit longer. I see a couple of people haven't clicked on that yet. Okay, um, underneath the hand icon, if you have a question uh, for us as well, and there's uh, actually two presenters tonight, underneath attendees, you'll see another tab that says questions. If you can click on that plus sign to the left of questions, it'll open up an area for you to be able to type in any question that you have. At this time, can you all just type in that you can hear me? And if you can hear me, please type in that you are unable to hear me. Okay, thank you. Give a little bit longer. I'm just waiting for everyone to respond. And again, for those of you, if you cannot hear me, just go ahead and type in I'm not able to hear you or just no will be fine as well. Okay, looks like we're good to go on that end as well. Tonight's web, um, webinar, we're actually going to cover protecting and minimizing the risk of becoming a victim of identity theft, safeguarding yourself against credit, debit, fraud, protecting your privacy and your family's privacy, We'll go over some resources with IDT 911, as well as additional resources with your credit union. We'll also talk about ID enforcer credit monitoring and identity theft protective services. Um, as many of you are aware, I'm sure, um, as technology grows, so do the number of people that have been hit by identity theft. At this time, what I am going to do is I am going to introduce our next presenter. Her name is Deborah Sullivan. And at this time, for Deborah, I'm going to go ahead and have her talk to you a little bit more about ID Theft 911. Okay, looks like I had you on mute, Deborah. You can go ahead and talk. Okay, good evening, everyone, and thank you for participating in tonight's webinar. Um, I'm very happy to have been invited by the credit union to speak to all of you about, about a crime that continues to grow in scope and impact more and more of us. So what is identity theft? It's defined as the unauthorized use of personal identifying information, or PII as we refer to it, in order to obtain goods, money, or services for any unlawful purpose. And if you look at this picture, obviously the, the point is that it can happen to you and, and that's just a random person um, whose uh, um, face is circled there. But if you really think about it, anybody on this little graphic can become a victim of identity theft. And even more importantly, all of us who are participating in this webinar stand a very good chance 
of becoming victims of identity theft and identity fraud. And hopefully tonight's webinar will give you some ideas on what you can steps that you can take to protect yourself and resources that are available to you if you do become a victim. So how can your identity be used? There, there are several ways. Uh, from a financial perspective, um, an identity thief can open lines of credit in a victim's name. From a criminal perspective, those same thieves might use the victim's name and identity um, and end up with a traffic violation or a crime that ends up on the victim's uh, arrest record and criminal record. And it can also be used for, for cloning, using the victim's name and their personal information to create a whole new identity. All of those are, are equally concerning situations that we'll talk about a little bit more here. If you look at the, the, the complete scope of identity fraud, um, the facts around this are astonishing. Last year, almost 13 million U.S. consumers became victims of identity fraud. For those who are spending money out of their own pocket to resolve a fraud situation, the mean cost to them was $115. If you look at data breaches, which we're all hearing about on the news almost on a daily basis, one in four consumers were data breach victims last year. And of those one in four, one in seven breach victims actually experienced fraud. So the numbers are staggering. So if, if you look at this, this slide, um, you'll see that um, when we talk about identity fraud and identity theft today, we tend to talk about the things, the types of activity that are new, exciting, or frightening. And the thought of someone committing a crime in your name and causing you to be arrested or using your information to obtain medical services, which could cause you to receive a misdiagnosis or a life-threatening threatening treatment, that will definitely grab your attention. But the reality with fraud and identity theft is that most of these criminals are after what they've always been after, and that's the money. So 33% of victims discovered their fraud from their financial institution through looking at their bank accounts and their records. I mentioned earlier that one in seven data breach victims experienced fraud, and in total last year, Almost 86 millions were exposed. This graphic looks at data breaches from the 2005 to the 2014 time frame. And you can see while the number of breaches has varied somewhat, it's gone up and down, but you can see the trend between 2011 and 2014, it has been increasing steadily. And if you look at the number of records exposed, um, that is, as I said earlier, that, that 86 million uh, records. And, and the number of people whose information is exposed is, is significant. So what is personally identifiable information, or PII? If you look at this little graphic, on the left side uh, where it says legend, all of those data elements can be used to perpetrate identity fraud. Obviously, something like your social security number is the gold mine if identity thieves get hold of that information. Um, they can combine that with account numbers like bank accounts, insurance policies, investments, credit cards, etc. But there's other information that thieves can get hold of to commit fraud. Things like your email address, your physical address, telephone numbers, information from government issued identification like licenses, birth certificates, passports, um, full birth date and birth place. 
verification data that's used to open accounts and recover passwords, such as mother's maiden name. But people even use pets and kids' names as part of, of um, log, login information and then password creation. And if thieves get hold of that, they can use that to perpetrate fraud. Medical records information can be used to, to commit identity theft and get medical services fraudulently. And then the new frontier is really in the area of online information because the thieves have gotten smarter and smarter and they're going to social media and to places like Facebook to try to gather this type of information and use it to either impersonate you if they get enough information on you or to create a whole new identity as I mentioned a few minutes earlier. If you look at the right side of the chart um, next to that little graphic of the, of the man, um, that is really saying that no matter um, who we are or what, what our role or place is in life, whether we're you know, parents, citizens, employees, consumers, investors, patients, internet users, et cetera, we stand the risk of having our personal identifiable information exposed and compromised. So the fraud that makes the headlines and, and uh, movie marquees, it often involves crimes that were committed in someone else's name. Again, false medical information being added to patient files and imposters who assume false identities. But once again, just keep in mind that the reality is that most of these criminals are after what they've always been after, and that is the money. And financial fraud is, is more pervasive. Um, identity theft has been the top consumer complaint to the Federal Trade Commission for 14 consecutive years now. As a standalone category, tax fraud ranks as the number one consumer complaint with 33% of all reported identity theft complaints. But if you were to look at credit card banking and loan identity theft as a single financial fraud category, it ranks a very close second to tax fraud, and it represents 30% of all consumer complaints. So collectively, tax and financial identity theft account for 63% of all complaints, and why is that? Because again, the criminals are after the money. So tax fraud still gets a lot of attention in the media, but financial fraud does not. And that's because most financial fraud is so frequent that it becomes almost mundane when it's compared to criminal, medical, tax, and other categories. So despite accounting for approximately one-third of all identity theft activity, financial fraud doesn't get the necessary attention that it deserves. So in this webinar, we're going to talk about criminals get hold of your data, how fraud occurs, and what you can do to protect yourself. So financial fraud takes on a variety of forms, from simple to complex. However, it usually involves the creation of new accounts or the takeover of existing accounts. So identity thieves will use stolen consumer data to focus on credit card, checking, cell phone, mortgage, and auto loan accounts with the intention of generating a profit. Perpetuating themselves as a consumer, they can open brand new accounts, or if they don't know where the consumer holds an account, they can take over the existing account. And while both of these situations are very serious, consumers can focus on trying to remediate new account identity theft without serious impact to their day-to-day -day lives. However, in an account takeover situation, the consumer can find themselves without access to funds, having additional debt added to their current obligations, have phone lines shut down, or even have their home 
in jeopardy of default. Who are the victims? As you can see from this graph, no age is immune to identity theft. However, the theory is that the more active consumers are with their information, the more channels it ends up in and the more likely it is to be intercepted. So you can see that approximately 75% of identity theft victims are between the ages of 20 and 59. The age category or group, which is when consumers are using their personal data most frequently. In 2014, the Federal Trade Commission reported 2.6 million consumer fraud complaints that totaled $1.7 billion in fraud. And these are just the reported numbers. We don't know how many other people became victims and didn't report the activity. For those who become direct victims of fraud, their cost is the countless hours that they need to spend resolving the fraud and the credit and reputational damages that are associated with the fraud. And in many cases, these consumers also have direct out-of-pocket expenses, including the fraud amount. And perhaps even more importantly, they're often looked at as the suspect rather than as the victim. So there are two main groups when it comes to identity thieves. There are the individual opportunists, and there are organized groups. Individual opportunists usually appear when they discover the value of the consumer data that they've come in contact with. So on one end of the spectrum, it could be a good employee who turns bad, and on the other end, it could be a low-level criminal who breaks into cars and homes. In both situations, these people come into possession of personal data even though the possession of that data might not have been their primary focus. Uh, in the case of the, the rogue employee, it may have been a matter of trying to get back at an employer for a perceived misjustice or perhaps having been about to be fired. And in the case of that low-level criminal breaking into cars and homes, he or she is probably looking for things like you know, flat screen TVs and expensive laptops and other expensive devices. But if they do come across documents with personal identifiable information, it just makes what they've stolen more valuable. And they know the value of this information, and they can seek to try to use it themselves, or in many cases, sell it off to organized groups. In either case, they're looking to profit financially. So here's one example of an opportunist at work. In June of 2015, an employee named Monique Walker, who was an assistant clerk at a hospital, allegedly stole personal information, including names, birth dates, and social security numbers from thousands of patients. Over a period of a couple of years, she gathered and sold the data of 12,000 of those patients for as little as $3,000 per patient record. And she sold this to a gang of identity thieves. And the authorities reported that her accomplices used the stolen information to open new credit accounts and to go on shopping sprees. And while this case is still in the courts, and the perpetrators have yet to be convicted, it shows just how easy it is for one employee to turn and expose thousands of consumers to identity theft and to fraud. Now, on the other side of the spectrum, as I mentioned, we have the organized group. And these can range from street gangs to sophisticated criminal operations, both domestically and around the globe. Originally, street gangs came across consumer data during the course of their quote-unquote normal criminal activities, such as breaking into houses and automobiles. 
And while they were doing these break-ins and stealing cars, snatching purses, etc., they were focused on the money and the material items. But as I said earlier, the consumer data was a bonus. Now things have turned around. In today's world, many gang activities are focused strongly on gathering consumer data. And these criminals will target small businesses such as doctor's offices to steal patient files. They'll also target community mailboxes and business parks where they will literally cut the bottom off of the mailbox and steal the whole thing. And they will look at the contents of those patient records or, or data uh, records that are in mailboxes um, that will give them access to consumer data and personal identifiable information on patient records. The, the example of um, cutting into the mailbox in a business park, that will also give them access to business checks that they can use to wash existing checks or counterfeit new checks in order to commit a variety of other financial crimes. So the news is constantly filled with stories about that surround ID theft and organized crime. And one of the most recent stories that I'm sure you're all aware of involved the hacking of the Internal Revenue Service. Many of you may have seen this story in the news, but basically an organized crime ring out of Russia hacked an IRS website and stole the personal data of 100,000 taxpayers. And this is not uncommon. Many of the large breaches we see in the news are connected to foreign organized crime rings. So if you look at these boxes, you can see that these gangs and rings have the resources to hire very talented hackers. These hackers have the skills to pursue more complex financial crimes, and they can use the data that they've gotten, whether it's banking, credit card, and personal data, to commit a variety of crimes, again, all of which are lead to a clear purpose to hunt for and profit from sensitive stolen data. So how do they get the data? You know, it's, it's easy to get distracted and think that the loss of our data only happens online. And yes, that does happen a lot. But in the age of, uh, and day, uh, day of technology, sometimes the way our information gets compromised is by good old-fashioned theft. So if you think of it as old-school methods, um, these go dumpster diving. Um, you've probably heard this a million times, but you can't simply throw away solicitations such as credit card, pre-approved credit card offers, or documentation, you know, copies of old tax returns, copies, you know, utility bills, um, anything that might have a piece of data that could cause a, an identity thief to perpetrate fraud. And these thieves can't wait to go through people's trash to try to find information they can capitalize on. Mail theft, the mail is a vulnerable source of information, and there are many ways they can intercept it. They access unsecure mailboxes, create counterfeit master postal keys, or they simply go online and complete a mail forward request. And then once the mail is being forwarded, or just before that request goes in, they can drive by a home that's for sale or a home that looks like no one happens to be living in there, and they will go into mailboxes and see what's in there, what they might find. Might be a gold mine of information. Then forwarding mail to their, their address to get hold of that data as well. And then there are the home and car break-ins. Um, these thieves um, recognize that personal data has value, just like the physical flat, flat screen or laptop. And even if they aren't committing identity theft themselves when they're breaking into homes and autos, 
they most likely will know someone who's interested and willing to pay for personal data that they might come across. The bulk of consumer information is stolen electronically. So here are the new school methods. Uh, many of you have probably heard the term phishing. Uh, despite hearing about it, understanding what it is, millions of Americans each year fall victim to phishing attacks. For those of you who might not know what phishing is, it's a scam that's typically carried out with the help of an unsolicited email or a fake website that poses as a legitimate site in order to lure in potential victims and prompt them to provide valuable and per, uh, personal and financial information. You may get an email from what looks, what appears to be uh, your the credit union, and it will it would ask it will ask for you to enter personal information or tell you that they need to do an investigation and that they need you to provide them with some information. Don't do it. It's always wise to contact the institution that that communication came from uh, to determine if it's legitimate. And in most cases, I would venture to say in almost every case, it's not legitimate. Same thing happens with phone calls, where someone will call trying to get information out of you in order to perpetrate fraud. Don't provide information out of the phone if you don't know who you're speaking with. Spyware is another big one. If you click on links or download files, those can lead to spyware being added to your system. Once spyware is active, it lets these online criminals into your information and they can steal that from your computer and track all of your keystrokes. Once they've gotten all this information, they can commit many different forms of identity theft, including financial identity theft. Data breaches, we talked about those a little bit earlier. Um, the big one, Target was the biggest one, but the most recent hack of the um, Office of Personnel Management of the US government even tops that one for sheer size and the number of people impacted. And this is no accident that these huge organizations and companies are being targeted by these criminals. And they do that because of the enormous amounts of data that these businesses hold. But they also target small business because they know the security is weaker. Um, small businesses typically do not have the resources of a larger organization. Um, or the, the financial luxury to employ people who are sophisticated about protecting data and very knowledgeable about what's needed to protect the customer data, the consumer data that they're taking in. And this data, all the data is for sale. If they can't buy it off the street, the criminals know they can buy it online. And many, many, there are many sites that sell sell stolen U.S. citizen data, just like you or I would buy something off of Amazon. You can get a name, date of birth, and social security number on many sites for as little as $10. And it's cheaper if you buy in bulk. So what do they do with the data? You know, not surprisingly, credit card fraud accounts for over 50% of all financial fraud categories. And credit cards allow criminals to remain anonymous while making fast cash in what's a relatively risk-free environment. So let me give you an example um, of, of uh, what identity thieves do with the data. Say I'm an, an identity thief who wants to open a credit card using your information. So here's what I do. I complete an online credit card application on the credit union's website. And at the same time, I'm selling items on eBay that I don't have yet. And let's say one of these is a brand new iPad that will cost $600. I find a buyer for that iPad on eBay, 
and that person who was buying it transfers the funds to me online. Then I use that fraudulently open credit card to purchase the iPad from a legitimate site using the buyer's address as the shipping address. So I've now successfully made $600 without even being physically present. So it, it's pretty slick and it's pretty easy to do. If at any time the credit union or the merchant becomes suspicious and cancels the card or the purchase, there's no risk to me. I simply move on to the next card and the next transaction. If I'm the consumer, I now have to go through a process to dispute any accounts that were opened with the creditor and attempt to get the account removed from my credit profile. And m many of the creditors still consider the consumer the suspect until it's proven otherwise. So that consumer, you, you guys who are listening here, you need to work to repair the damage to your credit caused by these inquiries and delinquent accounts. So how can you protect yourself? I'm going to give you some tips here. Some of them may be familiar to you, but I think it's very important that we go through them again. Protect your social security number as, as much as is possible. Don't carry it in your wallet or purse. Provide it only when necessary. Ask why someone want, needs your social security number and what they're going to use it for. If you don't feel comfortable with providing it, then don't do it. But never give it out over the phone, via email, or online unless you're absolutely positive that you know who you're communicating with. Err on the side of caution. If you're not comfortable, don't do it. Um, manage your mail. Make sure your whole mailbox is secure. Don't dispose of documents in the trash. Use a cross-cut shredder for all unwanted or unneeded documents, including those pre-approved credit card offers. Be cautious when you're online. Don't open emails or click on links from untrusted sources. Don't provide any personal information to unknown parties online. Be sure that you have antivirus, anti-malware protection on your computer and that it's up to date. Make your passwords complicated. Don't use the same password for every account, especially your email account. If you're using the same password on your email that you're using on bank account, all a thief needs to do is get hold of that email password. And if they can figure out where you're, you're doing your, your banking business, they can use that password to try to access those accounts. Monitor your accounts and credit. Ex uh, monitor existing credit and deposit accounts on a regular basis and report immediately any suspicious activity. Regularly obtain copies of your credit report. You're entitled to free copies once a year from all three credit bureaus by going to www.annualcreditreport.com. If you've experienced identity theft, consider enrolling in credit monitoring, which the credit union offers, and we'll talk about that in a little while, so that you receive alerts early and you can take action to protect yourself and prevent a situation from going further. So what do you do if you become a victim? Of course, the first thing you want to do is call the credit union first. Make sure that you, you document your actions, file a police report. The credit union will uh, help you with um, getting in touch with us, and we can place a fraud alert on your credit report. If needed, we can place a security freeze on your credit report. And we will discuss with you the pros and cons of doing that so you can decide if you want us to place that alert. We can help correct your credit report. 
We can help notify your creditors that you've become a victim of identity theft. We can help you contract, contact the Federal Trade Commission to report your, your victimization. You're very fortunate that LAP Federal Credit Union provides free identity theft resolution support to all members through my company, IDT 911. We've worked with LAPD Credit Union since 2005. You members have unlimited access to professional fraud specialists at IDT 911. And this includes proactive assistance, assistance in resolving actual identity theft, and unauthorized activity for all members. With our services, our highly trained staff will help you with everything you need to do from prevention to resolution. We do it all. We treat each, each customer situation as unique, and we will work with you to listen to what has taken place, to develop a plan of action. We will share that plan of action with you, let you know the steps that we're going to take and where we need your assistance and involvement. And then we will advocate for you throughout the resolution process and all along provide expert guidance and assistance. It's important to know, though, that even if you're in a situation where you've lost a, a, or a purse, had your wallet stolen, um, lost a phone, um, anything like that, and you don't have any evidence yet that fraud has been perpetrated, we still highly recommend that you call the credit union and they will transfer you over to us so that we can make recommendations on how, what you can do to protect yourself and steps that we can take to lock down your credit to prevent a, a situation that right now is not drastic but could be down the line if whoever got hold of that information wait to take take action and try to use it fraudulently. We're very proud that we have a 99% customer satisfaction rating for the last four years. Um, in addition, uh, we all, you're also able to access the IDT 91 website, and that includes the latest tips and trends on managing your identity. There's all sorts of valuable information out there, information on the, la the latest breaches um, that have been reported, um, blogs, blog postings, um, and case studies um, talking about situations where we have helped people who have been referred over to us. And our website is www.idt911.com. So you'll call the credit union at the number shown here, let them know you may be a victim, you'll be transferred to us, and you will be assigned a personal fraud specialist who will open an investigation. And again, that service is free to all credit union members. We'll work with you to understand the problem, advise on a plan of action, assist you working with creditors, credit agencies, et cetera, and offer tips and advice on protecting yourself from further problems. Now, now I would like to talk to you about ID Enforcer. This is a service uh, that the credit union offers. It's powered by IDC 911. And it will provide you with annual credit scores and reports. Um, depending on the package, it monitors change of address, social security number activity, and things like sex offender monitoring. Um, it will provide email notices alerting you to potential fraud and ID theft. And it's available um, at special member pricing. So if you go to the credit union website, you will see the three packages that are available to you. There's silver, gold, and platinum that can all be purchased. 
the silver package provides single bureau, which is TransUnion credit report monitoring and score, that's free to performance checking holders. It's $49.90 a year or $4.99 a month. These packages can be purchased via debit or credit card. The gold package provides Triple Bureau credit report monitoring and scores. It's $7.99 a month or $79.90 a year. And the platinum package for $9.99 a month or $99.90 a year provides that those Triple Bureau monitoring reports and scores in addition to court records, social security number traits, change of address, cyber internet surveillance, payday loan monitoring, and sex offender monitoring. This service is also available um, uh, in, in family packages. Uh, members enrolling in a family plan receive a 10% discount. Um, again, the packages are still the same but the prices are a little bit different for a family where more than one family member is enrolling. And you can see those on the right-hand side. Silver is 374 or 4488, gold 7191 or 599 monthly, and platinum, which is 749 monthly per person or 89.91 per year. The enrollment process is very simple and straightforward. Uh, on, once you click on the, the link on the credit union site, you will see the descriptions of the three bundles pop up. When you, if you click Learn More, it will bring up a page that tells you a little bit about what's included in the bundle. You see the prices there. If you click Buy It, it takes you right into the enrollment for the package you, you selected. So the enrollment process, first of all, you'll provide personal information, name, address, gender, date of birth, social security number, email addresses, etc. You will then enter payment information. Um, in this, this example, the plan selected was gold. It tells you uh, the prices for either monthly or annual. Uh, this, in this case, annual was selected, and it tells you how much you save by purchasing an annual package instead of monthly. You're going to enter your credit card number or debit card number with the expiration date, the CCV code on the, on the back of the card, and all of the other information related to the card, name, address, um, phone number, etc. The next step is to create user account information. You're going to create a username and password and security questions and answers that can help us help you recover a password if you, if you uh, can't, cannot remember it or have misplaced it. The next step is to accept the terms and conditions and read and understand the cancellation policy. Next, you will confirm your identity. You're almost all the way through. And you'll be asked a series of questions um, initially five questions that you need to answer successfully in order to complete your enrollment and start receiving the service. If you answer any of these incorrectly, a, another question will be, will be supplied. If you're completely unsuccessful in answering them, you can call us directly at IBT 911 for assistance. Our phone number is at the top of all of the screens. So this, um, this concludes my part of the presentation. Um, resources that are available, both my company and the credit union. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Deborah. Um, I want to just talk to you all a little bit, and then I'll open up the floor for questions, a little bit on how the credit union can actually help you as well. Um, many of you probably already received this. Um, we have the EMV, which stands for EuroPay, MasterCard, and Visa. Um, by providing this to our members, it improves payment security and makes it difficult for people to successfully commit fraud 
against your account. I wanted to explain to you a little bit on how that works because you know a lot of times we get a lot of questions regarding how is this different than the old uh, ATM or debit card that you were using in the past. The EMV chip card um, is a Visa, uh, like a Visa credit card. It can be used uh, anywhere that um, you can run a regular transaction. Every time you use your um, this card at an activated uh, terminal that is uh, EMV, um, it's a it's an EMV uh, terminal that you can actually um, use for your transaction. It generates a unique transaction code. Some might actually say that it's uh, called a token. This processes uh, prevent stolen data from fraudulently being used. How it does that, when you look at the difference between the card that you received that didn't have this EMV chip versus the new card, you'll notice that a, a traditional card contains unchanging data that makes it easy for counterfeiters to replicate the information over and over again. So basically, a lot of us were used, used to putting in your card, you put it in, it comes right back out, and every time you did a transaction, it would be followed up by that same code. With the EMV code on your car, it creates a unique transaction code, again, it's token, every time the card is used for payment that cannot be used again. So it makes it um, more difficult for um, counterfeiters, counterfeiters to be able to um, know what code you're using because the next time they go to use it, that code has already been utilized already in the system. So how does it work? Okay. Again, I stated that in the past, if you were using a code that did not have this EMV chip, you would slide the card in and take it right back out. For merchants that have um, been using the, the, um, the machines that are actually um, capable of running the EMV chip, what happens is you insert the card with the chip in facing up as shown on the picture. You're going to keep the card in the terminal throughout the transaction and follow the prompts on the screen. One of the reasons why you're keeping the card in the terminal is because unlike the magnetic strip cards that didn't have that chip, the EMV chip actually takes a little longer to verify the legitimacy and create a unique token for that transaction. If you were to pull the card right out immediately after inserting the card, it would deny your transaction. So you want, want to make sure that you keep it in um, the entire time. In addition to that, after you do that, you'll go ahead and remove the card um, when prompted. A lot of uh, merchants already have this uh, enabled into their uh, stores. This was effective act after October 1st, 2015. However, there are still some merchants that have not um, added this to their stores yet, and it's, it looks like they will have it um, by the end of 2017. So, you know, some merchants are taking a little bit of time to be able to do this, but again, it is something that um, you can go ahead and use. It provides more security. And if you do happen to go to a merchant that does not have the capability to run an EMV card, it's fine. It still has the magnetic strip on the back for you to run as a, a normal transaction as you would have in the past. Okay. At this time, I am going to open up the floor for questions. If you take a look at the bottom of your GoToWebinar toolbar, again, you will see the questions um, tab. And just go ahead and type in your question in that field. I will then read your question out loud because this webinar is being recorded. In addition to this webinar being recorded, I will send out a survey at the end um, asking you, the things that you liked and or did not like about the webinar so that you can help us provide a better service to you and um, do some additional workshops and webinars that you are interested in. So at this time, if you have a question, please type in your question and I'll read it out loud for either myself or Deb to answer. So 
I just want to make sure that everyone sees where the question tab is. And I'll wait just a couple more seconds to see if anyone has a question. Okay, so uh, we do have a question. It is, is IDT 911 available regardless of where your ID theft happened or only with the LAP FCU account? It's, it's um, available wherever the fraud happens, uh, transpired. It doesn't have to be related to, um, to your account at the credit union at all. Um, it, might, it may be uh, from a, di a different credit card um, or from a, a debit card at another institution, but it's not tied to any account, having an account at, or I'm, I should say not tied only to accounts, fraud on accounts held at LAP Credit Union. Okay, thank you, Deborah. Um, the next question is, is an EMV chip the same as RFID, what about suspects that use RFID scanners? Um, I need a little bit more information on that. I'm not familiar with RFID scanners. Um, I can definitely look into that and get a response back to you um, when during office hours tomorrow and also send it out to the group. Uh, Myra, I can, I can take a, uh, a shot at that if you want me to. Sure, great. Um, the RFID scanner, RFID stands for radio frequency ID, and it's a scanner that um, a, a thief would carry around, and it can read the information on the mag strip on, on credit cards in someone's wallet. It, it, it can almost like penetrate a, a purse or a pocket, uh, it, you know, if, the, if a wallet, say, is in someone's pocket. Um, I don't know if that would would um, work with an uh, or if an e, the EMV chip would would defeat that scanner because there is no uh, mag strip on the card on the EMV card I don't believe. Okay, thank you, Deborah. And for the member that asked that question, if you can just type in if she was a, if she answered it. Um, for you, or if you would still like me to do some research on that, that way I can make sure that I follow up. That would be greatly appreciated. Um, the next question is, when will this chip be on the debit cards? Um, currently, um, effective October 1st, that was the deadline for major credit card um, issuers, so for MasterCard, Visa, Discover, and American Express. I have not heard anything about the, just the regular debit cards at this time, but we definitely will keep our members posted as we get more information on that. The next question is, I just wanted to thank the credit union for spreading the word on identity theft, and you're very welcome. Um, this member puts, I am assigned to Commercial Crimes Division Valley Financial. Please feel free to contact our office to answer questions from our end. Great. Thank you so much. That's a wonderful resource that you have uh, provided, and I will definitely keep that in mind when I talk to my management team uh, tomorrow morning. And again, for the member that asked the question regarding RFID, if Deborah's answer was sufficient for you, if you can let me know, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, otherwise, I want to make sure that I do follow up with that question on my end if there's additional information that you would like to know. Um, let's see. It would be nice. There are some companies stating that the scanners can read the chips. Um, eventually, they will sell free to product the credit cards. And that was from the member that had the question for you, Deborah, with the RFID. Yeah, can you repeat that, Myra? Um, it was really just a statement. It says it would be nice. There are some companies stating that the scanners can read the chips. Um, eventually, they sell they will sell the sleeve to protect the credit cards. So I'm thinking that um, that member would like me to research a little bit more because they're hearing um, that some companies are stating that the scanners can read the chips. So I'll look into that a little bit more and get that out to the team. Okay, great, thanks. 
You're welcome. Okay, I have a couple of more minutes if anyone else has a question. Okay, let's see. Um, this is actually more of a statement. Some banks give out free credit card sleeves to protect the cards. Um, I will definitely um, let my department know. I'm in the marketing department, so we're always looking for um, things that our uh, members would find more helpful and useful. So a credit card sleeve um, is definitely something that I'll pass on um, during our meetings here in, our, in the marketing department. Okay, we do have another question. It says, uh, LAPFCU requires us to use the debit card so many times a month. So it would be really nice to have a chip on the debit cards. Um, definitely. Um, I definitely agree um, with that. Again, this isn't something that we implemented. So there is a deadline for when certain cards need to uh, be upgraded. And once we get that information out, we'll definitely get that out uh, to our members. We started with the credit cards uh, first um, because that was what we were basically uh, told to do um, as a law. And it's a lot of merchants that have been given that as well. So we did that one first. But I definitely uh, agree it is something that we'll be looking into and keeping you all updated with that information. Um, let's see, wallets are sold with that protection as well, and thank you. A lot of them looks like the rest are um, more of statements, which I will take Deborah on my end and just share with our marketing team um, the thoughts of our members. Again, I will also be sending out a survey. That survey will definitely help us to provide more workshops and webinars that you are interested in. You can also um, email me when I send out the information to you as well. I will be sending out the recorded version of this uh, webinar to all that registered within the next two business days, so expected early part of next week. And if there are no more questions or concerns, I would like to thank you. Um, as well as our special presenter, Deborah from IDT911, for joining our webinar, and Deborah for being such a wonderful presenter. I will I look forward to seeing or seeing all of your names in future webinars. And please have a good night and be safe. Thank you. You're welcome.